Anxiety, the Positive Perspective Podcast. This podcast provides greater understanding and awareness for those challenged by anxiety and for the people that love them. Well-known authors Michelle LaFord and Jennifer Thompson bring it to the table with truth and vitality. Now, too. I'm yeah, going to record so now. It's both recorded. <laughs> You're funny. You are so much fun. I don't, I don't believe you had a dance. I don't believe it. It's too much fun. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Jennifer Thompson with Born for Wealth. And with me is Michelle Laporte, author of The Master Plan, Soaring Free of Anxiety. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's great. And that is book number... 23. So Michelle's written 23 books. And what's most amazing about that is during that entire period, most of which she was actually battling with a disorder, an anxiety disorder, which is what this whole podcast has come about. And um, so today we're going to unpack some more about that whole subject. But if we just came from, uh, from um, Easter, an Easter weekend, and, I, and Easter always... This, Regardless of your religious affiliation, Easter is a time for renewal and rebirth. Absolutely. Exactly, like spring. And I think us women know what it's like, uh, rebirth, renewal. We go through so many different stages in our lives, and sometimes we forget to see how powerful we are within. Right. <laughs> They were able to take through all, go through all that. I like, uh, as a financial advisor, I prefer Easter to Christmas because it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Eggs are a lot cheaper than gifts. That's but true. in the last, well, so uh, I want, we always, we make it a point to start with real affirmation, affirmation of, of women in general. And Mich Michelle, would you like to start for, uh, with that? Absolutely. We are strong. We are beautiful. We are nurturing, we are kind, and we have intent to move forward with a positive perspective. Therefore, welcome to the Positive Perspective Podcast. Great. And last week when we did this, when we did our, our first podcast, and the second and the third, I was, uh, one, one phrase Michelle used, because it was coming, coming up to Easter that resonated with me when she said she was looking forward to her, her girls coming over for Easter. And so during the Easter break, I thought of you, Michelle, and I wondered, okay, so tell, tell us, tell us what it's like now, you know, coming out of anxiety and having, having these people in your life. How was the weekend? It was wonderful. Um, I had all my girls in the same place. And what was really amazing is, I've seen on Facebook through the years where people recreate photos, you know, years later. And so it was a 10 year anniversary for us. And we had a picture of our three girls and my foster son at the time who I actually have now again at 15 years old. So we recreated that photo and it was amazing. And they had so much fun. Actually, I have, if I can peek around here, I have, this is the photo that we recreated. It's gorgeous. Yeah, so those are, those are my kids. And we got to recreate that photo and it was so much fun. And it, it was just everything I wanted it to be. Coming out of it, it gave me um, yesterday a little bit of uh, anxiety because I didn't feel like I was where I wanted to be yet. You know, that last challenge that I have of the traveling is it's taking so much time because I really have to master each step and I want to just propel myself forward. So I redid my master plan so that I could make progress maybe a little bit faster uh, and see what we can do with that. So kind of fine tune that yesterday and came back into Tuesday today, which I'm going to say is my Monday. I sort of just took the day off yesterday and, you know, yeah, the rest of them headed out the door. So I took some time to reflect on myself and the enjoyment that I got from the weekend was, uh, it was truly wonderful. I mean, I love my girls and my grandson was here and it just, that's a joy. He's such a great kid. And so, um, we really had a good time. Really right. had a good time. 
take a couple of things that come up for me. Year, years ago, when you were right in the, in the midst of feeling this anxiety, what would the weekend like that look like for you back then? <laughs> Wow. Um, it would have been filled with guilt because they had to come and see me. Okay. Um, it would have been really just anticipating it all for a week or more. I would have been really obsessively worrying on somebody couldn't make it. What if they had an accident on the way? Was um, everybody going to be safe? Would the food turn out right? Just anything that I could have worried about, I would have worried about. And I think I had one fleeting moment of please travel safely, you know, the to and from. So, but then I just put it off and let it go and it all worked out. And so it was just, it's so different because I just don't worry about things that I used to worry about all the time. That's awesome. Yeah, it feels much better. That's lovely. So the experience is different. I just, I never, I will never forget that when you said, you know, you're looking forward to this weekend. Cause I remember years ago when I used to have people over, I'm like, Oh my God, I wouldn't have been saying, Oh my, how excited I am. I'm like, you know, because holidays have that, that connotation of expectations, meeting expectations, and also, you know, uh, work to be done. And um, I love some of the emotions that you want, that you actually are mentioned. And I think as we unpack anxiety and what that means is, you said some of that. There's, I can hear some self-doubt, guilt. Yeah. Uh, you, and that's what seems to plague, would you say that sort of plagues uh, people with, who are suffering from anxiety? Well, it certainly did for you. Yeah, I think, well, and I talk to people daily about anxiety that do deal with it. And I, I've sort of reckoned that I'm an anxiety coach. Uh, yes, yes. helping you know that team work towards the win and so when when I look at that I mean I did to other people who were just so worried to get with family members mm. they feel like they're a burden you know they need things to be done a certain way so that they can remain somewhat intact and I think that hearing them you know I didn't have that and I'm so thankful that I didn't have. I mean, I have some real stuff, you know, I mean, we deal with real things, but I see myself generating such uh, calmness. And my daughter tells me sometimes, you're just too patient for me. And I think <laughs> yeah, that's what I want, you know, because I can be patient now where nothing has to happen at that time. But then you have to draw some reality into it. And I think at times you have to just say, you know, I'm not going fast enough for me right now. It's not anybody else. But where do I want to want to end up? And I think one of the things that I did was I created what I wanted day to look anxiety free, looked like, and I wrote that down. And right now, I think that that vision might have changed a little bit. So I'm going to go do that exercise again. As a matter of fact, that's my week task is yeah. to look at today, what maybe living anxiety free looks like for me. And now I want to go forward and say, what do I want my life to look like from here? Because I've sort of stalled out, you know, until I make my move um, and the relationship, we're at a good place. Um, I'm not always satisfied with it. And, you know, that's the reality. Relationships have an ebb and a flow. Right. And, you know, I kind of want my goodies now and it's not the right time. <laughs> so I have to be more patient with that. And yes. yeah, I still need to, to really look and identify some things. Um, I think everyone in their lives, like I decided I was going to write another book and it's going to be called how to change your life in 10 steps. Mm -hmm. And I acronymed it with acceptance. And I was working on that today. You have to assess today. You really have to look at what is today realistically look like? Okay, what are you happy with? What are you not happy with? It doesn't matter. What does today look like? Then the second step would be create tomorrow. What do you want it to look like? Because when you don't know, when you literally don't know what you want, you can't work towards it. Then, yeah, so we're going to assess today, create tomorrow. We're going to compare the two and make that list. And then we're going to get an everyday routine because we all need that everyday routine. 
Then we're going to do the positive perspective. We're going to make sure that our attitude is in the right place to begin movement. Yes. And then we're going to make a task list. And from that tax, task list, we're going to take action. And we're going to take one challenge at a time. So from that list that we've made, the comparison of the two days, we want to take the easiest challenge and start mastering that so that we can knock it off the list and go to the next one. And then we're going to take the negative to a positive because we know that there's going to be some negativity. And then we're going to celebrate each success and enjoy the journey. And so I've acronymed that acceptance. Um, and I think working with people, we talk about, you know, what would it be like if I was anxious? Um, I don't want to remember what that was like. That, yeah, that, I try not to look back at that. But what I really try and do is focus on this is what it looked like today. And I still have pieces. We had an experience with the pancake. <laughs> Where? <laughs> I, I was going to mention that. I, I'm assuming there were no pancake issues this weekend. <laughs> no, but they have resonated through. You know, it's still that little bit of, are you really where you say you are? And I've decided I just don't like people touching my food. I just, it's odd. And I think you well, I, to be really honest, I think what you were expecting is quite natural. I don't. I think a lot of people don't like people touching their food. I'm not. The, I'm not the biggest cook, but every time I entered the kitchen, I stayed away because I was afraid I'd touch something when right. someone else was cooking. So I think right. what you felt was really normal. Well, and it, yeah, it kind of might have. It was okay, but how I reacted to it. Yes, that's the point. The you know, that was over the top, and <laughs> so my answer was. I would lick your hands. I mean, you know, I don't care. It wasn't anything to do with that, you know? I mean, I could pick something up off the floor and lick it, but it's just, it was, I don't know. It was just there. And so, you know, I think it's something to think about. It just caught me off guard. It was a habit. And those habits are really hard to break. Yeah. You know? And, and and it sort of sounds like Michelle, it's a bit of a vicious cycle. Like let's let's magnify uh, just for the sake of people listening in and and for our understanding the the pancake issue. Someone touched your food when they weren't supposed to. It's really neat. What happens is, I think what I hear is that first there's the overreaction, and then you feel then you beat yourself up for the overreaction, right. and the beating yourself up was the overreaction to the overreaction. And so that's anxiety. Yeah, that's, that's something way. with anxiety. You can't just let it go at that. Um, and then you have to think about it, you know, because you have a history with, yeah. with your people. or You know, you can take a major step back at that. And for me, it wasn't when I think of something like this. Yes. I cannot go backwards. I refuse to go backwards. So I just stop and I think about it and I think, okay, you know what really happened? Is it an issue? Had I been prepared for it? No, not an issue. Mm -hmm. But because it caught me off guard. Um, yeah. I had some people in my life about a year and a half ago literally destroy everything. And um, from calling the IRS and telling them I was cheating on my taxes and getting me put in an audit that literally lasted an entire year before they gave me my refund to getting me kicked out of my home to yeah. ruin, ruining major relationships uh, to coming after people that I cared for and doing somewhat similar things to them. Uh, they took away things that were important to me and so really paying attention to the master plan and releasing toxic people and toxic emotions is so important. And so, yeah, you know, when you rekindle with family members and stuff, as you progress through this program, you have to understand they got used to you a certain way. Yes. And so you're throwing them off guard. And I really have to put myself in the position of the other person. And sometimes it's not fun. You know, sometimes what I see looking is, well, you look better, but are you really better? 
Mm. Now, are you really better? Are you really better? And so it's just a good place. How does, that, how does that feel, Michelle? Like when I listen to that, so that makes me feel uneasy. How does that make you feel when someone says that? Are you really better? Well, I ask myself that sometimes as well. And I think it is a depressed moment. But if you're able to observe emotions and actually have them and let them go, yes, you, you can still soar free. And right. so for me, it was just experiencing the emotion at the moment, taking what I can from it, learning some sort of lesson right. and applying that to the rest of the day or days to come is probably the example I want to host. Now, in every relationship, whether it be your children, your spouse, your uh, partner, your friends, your family members, we all scrutinize each other completely. Those are the people that we like to judge and harshly judge yes. because we have something uh, of a vulnerability. And so I try and understand the vulnerability. Now, I spend a lot of time alone. Um, it was something that I had challenged because I paid people to stay with me. And so now I've gone to the other side where I spend too much time alone. So now one of my, my new challenges is to create a balance there. I know that I can stay by myself, but I don't like it. You know, I energize from people. I thrive with conversation. Yeah. 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 And so being able to um, really identify what I want my life to look like in a balanced arena now that yes. I've conquered some of that recovery is important. Yeah. <laughs> I have emotions now besides fear and they're weird. <laughs> you know, I'm 55 years old in a few months, in a month. And I have to look at, you know, somebody, I snapped at someone, they snapped back. They walk on and I'm, I'm injured like a, a bird with their wing broken, you know, so I'm working on that sensitivity. Don't be so sensitive. You know, it's just a day in the life. It's a day in the life. So it's like walking on eggshells for, for those around you <laughs> when you had anxiety. Was it sort of like that, walking on eggshells? I can't imagine. Um, <laughs> my daughter is very good at saying, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what you need me to say. I don't know what I need to do. So yeah, I think that they really don't yeah. know. So yeah. maybe we could talk about some things. Um, I do. Yeah. Yeah. If you have someone who is experiencing a panic attack, you know, where they're really ramped up, yes. touch them. Don't ask, ask permission. Yes. Can, can I, can I give you a hug? If you touch them, touch them gently. Yes. Firmly and say, I'm here if you need me. Yes. Okay, flip around your door. Oh, a little bit more the other way. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that, that whole thing about, um, you know, like, don't touch me, that really blew my mind. I'll be really honest. When you said for an anxious person, just don't touch them. Well, um, you know, when we care about somebody, what we want to do is envelop them and make them feel safe. You know, I just want to, when my daughter has what we call meltdowns, I just want to hug her, hold her, yeah. rock her like she's a baby. Well, that doesn't work. You know, they're having extreme emotions, which yeah. creates a physical response and you don't know what's going on in your body. And so, especially with somebody that has health anxiety or fear of dying during that time, mm. I think that makes them more uncomfortable. Like I've always said, if someone were having a heart attack, would you try and hug them? No, you need to assess the situation, you know, so we know they're not having a heart attack. So now we yeah. just need to say, I'm here. If you need me, we're going to get through this. Yes. Now, and if you really learn about anxiety yourself, and know what's going on, you can yeah. say more than that, but we just don't want you to do damage. You know, don't, don't you feel having been in that position yourself that you just keep damaging the relationship? Cause you know, you try and do something, something and they snap at you, you know, don't yeah. touch me. Well, then they don't know what to do. You know, God, I don't want to try anything. Cause then I'm going to make her worse or him worse. Mm. And so then you get to this place where you just don't know what to do. Yeah. And so I mean, we always, we always need people. It's just that we don't know how 
they don't know how to be needed. They don't know how to help you. And you know, when I was listening to you just the last little while, what really is interesting is when you said, um, you know, your anxiety, you're at 85%. You, you rated yourself. It tells me to, you're quite a high achiever. I just want you to know you do rate, do rate things. But it's also quite fascinating you know, you focused, you started a little bit on the focus of the 15% that you're not there. Well, but it's still, it's still an immobilization for me. Um, yes, that's good to know. Good for me to know. Yeah, because you take the smallest, easiest challenges first, right. you make a lot of progress real fast. You know, like one of mine was creating a relationship with one of my daughters, the youngest, mm. and we had not had a very good relationship. So um, that was my first thing. It took a text, you know, I had to make contact and it just went really well from the first thing. So within a few days I had what we call mastered that and I could move on to the next and it built some skill set that I could count on, you know, that if I, if I took that step, there was a chance that it would be a positive step. And so I could take bigger steps. So I had 21 challenges altogether. 17 of them went fairly quickly. And the last three were, I've spent better of six to eight months on them. So I think I can put one of those. I could probably move myself up to 90% now. <laughs> That's good. That's good. But I still have that travel, the traveling piece. The traveling thing. Could you give us a, can you tell us a few of those things, the 20 some steps, the 17 you did do? There's 21 of them. One of them was to create a relationship with my daughter. The second. No, that's hard for anybody, but. <laughs> well, and, you know, we, because we were a blended family and this is my stepdaughter. Right. She was not obligated to have that relationship at all. Right, right. And so it needed to be touched in a rather truthful and understanding manner but this is mm. the mother of my grandson mm. so for me it had dual meaning you know yeah. I did I wanted to be a part of his life to some degree um, because he feels like he's my grandson and now he calls me grandma he's three and now he calls me grandma yeah. and so you know it was it moved through but once I got it started it did employ some really nice yeah. aspects to it so even though I could take it off the list, it's still something that goes on and on today. Um, one of the things, um, because those people destroyed my life and I was around so many people because I was in such chaos. I was around so many people that participated in recreational drug use. It made me worry that someone might put something in my food or that it might accidentally get in my food. And I went to a place where I could not eat. I lost 57 pounds in less than a year. Um, I couldn't eat anything that was not sealed up like a bag of chips. You can tell if it's sealed, right, right. but a, a bag of bread just has a twisty tie. Okay. So I had to, um, I couldn't eat off plates or use utensils. Like this is so embarrassing, but I guess it's my truth. Um, anything that someone could touch where their hands might have been in a drug situation made me, I was incapable of moving past that because like, let's say that I would get a plate that someone might have been able to get to that had been doing drugs and the family that I had stayed with, they're riddled with meth, methamphetamine. And um, I had found a couple of rigs. Um, I had found baggies left. And they just, oh, seemed, just felt to me like it was everywhere, just everywhere. I wouldn't use the stove, the microwave. Um, mm. I could use to brush, like this is, <laughs> I was bad. I would brush my teeth. I would keep my toothbrush and my, and my toothpaste um, in a bag. And I slept on a couch in their house because I had custody of these children. So I slept on a couch in the house yes. and so, and it was my couch. So I would brush my teeth by going to the bathtub and turning on the faucet and getting my toothbrush wet. And then I'd use my toothpaste that was in and I would brush my teeth out of the bathtub. Okay. Cause they couldn't use any of the sinks because they like to 
you know, most of the time people who partake of drugs will get high in a bathroom. Oh. And so I could get to where I could use the kitchen sink unless one of them came over again and then I'd have to start all over. And yeah, so then I got myself a camper and I put a microwave out in the camper and I put some camp stove burners and bought myself my own pots and pans and I would go out into my camper that I redid and I would cook out there and I started to eat. But what I found out, and this was such a furious lesson, what I found out was that when I wasn't eating, my brain didn't function. Those phobias became so much more intense. The more I didn't eat, the worse the phobias got because I wasn't feeding my brain. The minute yeah. I started eating again regularly, it did not take a week before those things just started melting away. So the daily routine of the master plan, the eating right, the getting some sleep, the exercise, the vitamins to um, it's supplement. It's fundamental common sense thing, uh, really, yeah, day to day. Yeah. yeah, anxiety tears you up so bad. That's the first yes. thing that it attacks. And so if you can get that foundation back, it started melting away. So I would make tremendous progress. And like right. now, um, I eat off plates. I use utensils. I cook with pots and pans. Um, yes. I have a lot of food allergies on top of everything okay. else. So <clears throat> I'm allergic to MSG. I get a severe rash that lasts almost a month. And so I have the hiccups. I have to stay away from that. And I don't like people to bring it into my house. But, like, my mom came to visit, and then I have people in on the weekends. Well, we have some MSG. And now I just wash the dishes and use them. Whereas yes. six months ago, I couldn't do that. I would have, like, right. thrown pots and pans away. And right. I know when, <laughs> when my mom was here, she has a lot of it. And so I put some pots and pans for her to use up to the side and said, here, you can use these things. Your, your reactions are quite, quite severe, Michelle. They're not run of the mill reactions. They're quite severe. No, when you're talking people that have anxiety disorders and they're not going to tell you about them, you know, no. like really talking about these, I would prefer that no one knew because it's very embarrassing um, to a large extent. Like, you know, I couldn't eat off pots and pans and plates because someone was around that was doing drugs. Oh, yeah. I, I can understand that, though. But but, I mean, yeah, but, I mean, you just don't run and tell everybody that. You know, like, I would buy yeah. paper plates and or I would just eat. Like, I would... Okay, here's an example we laughed at the other night. I had some popcorn in a bag, okay? It's, like, called puff or something. It's just really soft, and it melts in your mouth, and I love them. And I had put Tiger Bomb on someone. And so it was on my hands. Well, if you know what Tiger Bomb is. Oh, my God. I remember it that. It never goes it's away. Okay. <laughs> you can wash your hands, but there's going to be some under some fingernail. Yeah. That you get on your lip and or yes. the bathroom. Oh, I hate Another fun thing. But so I didn't want to use my hands. And I opened the bag. And I reached and I was pouring them out and I said, oh my God, I haven't had to do that for so long because that's how I used to eat. Like I was touching things in that house and I yeah. would out because I might have meth on my hands, you know. And, and when it gets in your eye and everything. <laughs> and, heroin, and I mean, I'm trying to think. Meth, heroin, pills, oh my patches, um, they just, every, marijuana, uh, something they call dab which is something i mean that's a very stressful environment michelle oh that's my god crazy. it's like to kill me it's on a one on a scale of one to ten it's like about a ten eleven it was yeah. horrible and i was so phobic about it at yeah. one point that i just couldn't function and so we were laughing because i had opened that bag and i was pouring this popcorn in my mouth and I, you know she was looking at me like I was strange, and I was like, well, I haven't had to do this for a while. So I said, it's the, the tiger bomb. I don't want the tiger bomb in my mouth because it, it makes your tongue tingle for hours. <laughs> I remember that when, you, when I was a kid, and when it gets in your eye, it's like, oh, my God. It burns, and you're watering. So but I, I was pouring it in my hand, and I was giving some to the dogs. 
Okay. Yes. So first, I was throwing it at them, you know, because I give them treats every night. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm allowed to laugh. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, gotta, laugh. you gotta keep them separate or they're gonna eat each other. So I'm throwing <laughs> some over here for Callie. I'm throwing some over here for Tuffy. And so I, I get this and then Tuffy had come right beside me and I grabbed one and I handed it to him. And I saw, you know, I mean, it, this is my big boxers. And he takes it from my hand and he's lick, he licked on my hand. And I see him go. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I got Tiger Bomb on it. <laughs> so Tuffy, and, and, you know, because I didn't want any on me, but I put it in my board. My board. I'm calling the SPCA next time. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I wasn't no, wrong. It really was on my fingers still. So, yeah, poor dog. But... But Michelle, what caught what what you were saying that got my attention was your 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 allergies, your food allergies, like where you said the MSG, and you would you would be careful about the pots and pans, because I think it makes sense. It seems to me if you already if you have a predisposition to allergies, I mean to anxiety, uh -huh. it strikes me as is an acute sensitivity to what you're perceiving around you, and anxiety. Perceiving, because yeah. some of it for me is absolutely irrational. And so yeah. that's the difference. So you can go, let's say that I go in to eat today. Okay, and I think, oh, that person came into my house. Yeah. They're known to use drugs. Do I not want to eat off anything? <laughs> yes. No, I don't want to do that, you know? Yeah. And so I'll run through my head they didn't come in the kitchen. They didn't touch anything. Everything's okay. Okay. Now, if everybody comes in, let's say we order takeout. Yeah. And Chinese is the worst. For <laughs> I mean, it is the worst. So everybody yeah. puts it on the plates and everything. That makes me really um, obsessive in my thought. I'll think, did that all come off? You know, yes. and I used to, this is how I used to ensure that it got off. I would wash my dishes with Comet yeah. because I figure if I can see all the Comet off there, then it all came off. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's really hard. That, whole, ex that whole example that you unpacked just, just gave me so much insight. Yeah. And we have these quirks, I call them. Yeah. And everyone that has an anxiety disorder, the reason it's an anxiety disorder is they have these things. Something like, it's not always the same. Like, I don't know anybody else with anxiety that washes their dishes with Comet so that they can tell that all the MSG would be up. I don't. But like, I could, like, okay, like, I have a pen here. This is a pen that sits on my desk. Okay. I could not have done that. I could not have put that anywhere near my mouth last year because it was out. Okay. Yeah. And I know for a fact, five people picked up this pen this weekend and were writing notes on things and writing yeah. phone numbers down for yeah. each other. And, you know, and I can do it now. Yes. But if I let myself think about it enough, I could get to where that would bother me. Um, I'm trying to think something else. I, I just stay with what I know. I, yeah. I'm not very good at branching like food. I don't really eat foods that I don't know that I could eat. Like if we went to an Indian restaurant, I'd be like, I don't know how I would do with these spices. I'm allergic to, when we started at the allergist, this was my list. Peanuts, chocolate, olives, black and green, almonds, um, the MSG, and then I had medication allergies of penicillin. Um, hold on, my phone's gonna go off here. <laughs> I didn't turn one of them off. Um, okay, remind me where I was. Um, medications, erythromycin, uh, codeine, penicillin, and something else. So. Any antibiotic that I'd taken, I would rash. I rashed on penicillin when I was little, but I rashed really, really bad, like I turned all red. Right. And so my mom, I'm gonna label her for a minute, is kind of a hypochondriac. And so she pushed that off onto us as kids. So already okay. that piece, where you just don't go take medicine, but you, don't, you, know, you, you just don't go do it. 
and so I'm very, very um, hesitant, I would say, as to what medications I would take. Even right, right. And so then I would have these reactions. The last year I went to an allergist because I wanted to know. But because I was too phobic to let them do the pin prick, I call it okay. the scratch and sniff. <laughs> they poke you all over because I was afraid I was going to react really yes, bad. Yes. I had them draw blood and do it that way. Okay. And it came back. I'm allergic to nothing, nothing, indoor, outdoor, otherwise. And then the doctor looks at me and says, "You got to let me do the pig tricks. You have to, because I see your allergic responses. I see them." Like in my sign, you are allergic to things. I see it. And he said, so we have to figure out what it is. So he told me I had to quit smoking before I could come back. <laughs> and so when was that? <laughs> that was like November. And we're okay. in April. So, so I feel... moving you on to, to quit smoking. Yeah. And I do okay most of the time. Um, I'm just going to have to... Like I allow myself when I'm stressed, I don't worry about it. I just let it go. Yeah. The rest of the time I can kind of do it. But let me tell you, addiction to nicotine, apparently worse than heroin. And it is really hard. And that was my go-to. That was my, all those years of being stressed. That was my go-to. Mm. <clears throat> so it's familiar. Yes. But, yes. Yeah. Um, hope to be, uh, I gave it till June, so I'm hoping till then, because my birthday's in May. So I want to be <laughs> smoke-free and traveling by my birthday. It's coming around. It's coming around. It's exciting. Yeah, I'm double fives, man. <laughs> the other, the one thing I wanted to ask you, because now we, I've heard what anxiety, you've used a lot of words and unpacked anxiety quite nicely. What would you say is the opposite of anxiety? Because that's what we want people to get to. Peace. What's the opposite of peace? Yeah. A sense of inner peace. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Your head's not running through all these things. Right. If somebody walks in the house, it doesn't change up how you have to do everything, you know. Um, but, and I have a personal peace now that I don't let many people compromise. Um, yeah. I really... I don't hang out with very many people. Um, I'm really careful about chaos. Yes. Um, you know, there are people in my lives. I mean, we're all going to deal with some sort of kid. We have my mom in the hospital. My daughter's dealing with legal issues. Um, uh, the person that I date's been sick. Um, so we're, we have surgeon appointments and stuff. So those, that's not chaos. That's not driven by your actions. Yeah. That's so life. Yeah. Some that's that's life just happens. life happens. Yeah. And so we deal with those and I don't kick you out of my life because life's happening. Now, should you continue to create a uh, candid chaos in your life? From choices that you make, then I walk away. It's I have to distance myself. Um, I was speaking with my mom, and I said, "Your negativity is just—it's killing me." Oh, I, yeah. I cannot stand negativity. So I distance myself. Yeah, you got to do something. It's your mom, right? Yeah, she's been sick. I mean, she's been—it's oh, just horrible. And so we talked, and I said. You've got to try and get outside in the sun. I had her go with me a couple of places. She right. said, this is so weird being around you because you just get up and say, I'm going and you leave. Remember when you came to visit me, I didn't go anywhere. Yes. I didn't go anywhere. And so I'm up and I'm out and I'm going and I'm taking, you know, Bulby to school. I'm going over to my daughter's house. I'll run to the store and then I'll run to the store again later. And everybody, I'm like, Oh, do you need something in the store? I'll go. <laughs> and they're like, haven't you already been there like three times? And I'm like, yeah, but I'll go, you know, or if my friends are sick, I'm like, do you need anything? I'll go, you know, cause I want to return. A bit of a people the pleaser store. then, Michelle, a bit of a people pleaser. Would you say a bit of a people pleaser? No, I just like the fact that I can go. Like, okay. it's so That's cool to me because I couldn't. I had to pay people. There's a lady that was at Walmart. Her name is Tony. Um, she was a an assistant manager at the this line of Kansas Walmart. Shout out to this woman. I would fax her a list 
once a month and give her my debit card numbers. And she would go pick that list when she got off work and bring it to my house. That's how I got groceries when my wow. daughter was really young. I mean, this has been 15 or more years ago. But that woman made it so that we could eat when I was housebound. I think my daughter was maybe five. So we're talking about, you know, 18 years ago. And this woman didn't, she didn't steal any of my money. She didn't take any of the groceries out for herself, which had happened to me multiple times before. Mm. I would get people to go to the store. They would take my money and not go to the store. And, you know, I mean, I had so much happen. And so she was very kind. And that gave me the few months I needed to where I could get to a store. Um, that there have just been so many things that you don't, when people are going through, I, I say anxiety, depression comes along that a yes. lot. Yes, I heard, depression I heard that. Depression are so debilitating because you cannot tell people what you're going through because no. it sounds silly to even you. What do you mean you can't leave your house when you're starving to death and you have a kid? I still couldn't do it. I could, but I would have a massive panic attack and end up in the ER and I didn't have the money for that either. Wow. You know, there's so many things. And if you're suffering from that, if you know somebody who's suffering from that, you've got to get in there and say, there's an answer and I know what it is and I'll help you through it. And I will hold your hand until you can stand on your own. That's it. I just got to where I didn't want to be alive anymore. And I needed something or else I was going to go. And this may rate amongst people with anxiety disorders. And yeah. I can, yeah. And we were alluding to something the other day that, uh, the, like the spiral. The other thing is um, quite often people with an anxiety disorder might actually attract some degree of chaos. They do. I think you're yes. right. Saying, and yeah. There's two reasons. Okay. The first, the first would be um, law of attraction says we're going to attract what we are. So we tend yes. to come across each other via that. We need someone who understands us. Right. And right. The second thing is you've got those manipulators, those users and abusers, and they're going to play off of that. And let yes. me tell you, I had a beautiful five bedroom home that when I divorced, um, I had the house and yes. so when it was just me, the number of people who would need a place to stay, Oh, I'll help you. I'll help you. Who ended up just, Oh my God, massacring my life. that I finally just gave up the house and said, it's going to be better that way. And I don't have anything anybody can use, you know? And wow. so now I steer clear, but it also makes it, uh, when you meet someone new, you have to have that time to assess who they really are before you let go. So it's I'm really so awesome. glad you mentioned that. I'm so glad you said that, you know, and I think in subsequent podcasts or YouTube videos, I really would love us to talk about that. Sure. Boundaries, you know, boundaries and, and assessing and not feeling bad about the fact that you need to have time to assess someone. Not a jump you really do. Yeah, and you really do. And you were, yeah, you were being vulnerable and people sometimes take advantage. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I have horror stories of it. Just absolute horror stories. Yes. People living at my house for free, stealing my stuff in the middle of the night and leaving. I mean, major things, furnitures, you know, where I had let someone live with me and then they just pretty much cleaned me out in the middle of the night. And, yes. and I wouldn't even call the police because I was like... I had no idea where they'd be. I didn't know enough about it. I mean, it was that. Yeah. Right. Wow. That, you know, and I look at it as a character called on my own, but I also remember if I was by myself, I was worse. And so you just sort of, okay. take the yeah, I mean, I couldn't leave my house. My daughter needed to get to school. And so I would work really hard to get back out, you know, mm. and I didn't stay housebound very long. Uh, usually I would, I would realize it and then start really taking the measures to, right. but until the master plan, I would make progress, but then I would have a setback and be right back where I was. Yes. And with the master plan, I have actually used the master plan to recover 
that wow. whole time, the chaos of living at that house with the family, yes. Yes. Um, having my life destroyed, literally um, homeless for the most yes. part. I never, I never fell back. I never had a setback like that. Not at all. No. That's no. because I mastered all those things before I moved forward. That is so amazing, you know. That's encouraging for anyone with any sorts of mental illness or illness or, um, you know, maybe they want to change a mindset. That's just so amazing. I think we should, we could stop at this podcast right now. And because I, what I really would like is for the subsequent ones, we go through the master plan in detail with each step. Sure. And, and I want to see how you, how you personally have tackled each issue, each of those steps. Okay. Awesome. And expound on it. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Welcome. Michelle. Episode four. Yeah. Okay. Have a good day. You too. <laughs>